Good morning, happy Sabbath, and uh, welcome to uh, our church service this morning, to our Bodesset family, and it's an honor for me to be here uh, sharing the word with you this morning. It's been a couple of years since uh, we last uh, um, feasted on God's word. Last time I came was uh, when Pastor Arturo was your pastor, and uh, that was a few years ago. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Pastor Neil and uh, Chris for um, extending me the invitation to come and share God's word with you again this morning. And it's an honor and a privilege for me to be here. Um, our offering uh, this morning is for our local budget, as you are well aware that um, the electricity and water are not free. They have to be taken care of as well as uh, the rates. So uh, that's what our offering is for. As you can see on the screen, um, that's how you would uh, make arrangements in donating your or returning your tithe as well as your offering to uh, help out with the needs of uh, the Bodessa Church and family and the needs in our local area. And um, as we move on, and I'll pray over the offering as well as prayer over um, our sermon this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for um, life. Thank you for uh, the talents you've given us and the time and the effort that we have used during the week to earn a living. And uh, we come here this morning to return to you uh, a portion that you've asked of us, the 10% of the tithe, as well as our sacrificial or offering for the work here at Bodhisattva Church. We also, Lord, would like to pray your blessing upon those who may receive it in, uh, in our service to the community. And we also would like to ask, Father, for your presence as we uh, share your word and um, what message you have for us this morning. Bless our audience and those who will be listening, and may they take it to heart through the work of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had a, I had a privilege of studying the Bible with a couple of young people. Um, and we started off with the book of Genesis, from Genesis chapter 1 onwards. We got to the part in chapter 3 where Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Isolated from God and the perfect home and the beautiful uh, home he built for them, built on purpose. They realized that their disobedience brought sorrow, death, and decay. I, it brought isolation from their God, the God who used to commune to, with them daily, face to face, and just like Isaiah said in Isaiah 59, uh, chapter 59, verse 2, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have his, hit his face from you, that he will not hear. Their sin even caused anxiety and separation between themselves, as well as nature. Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the snake, and the snake had no leg to stand on. There you go, social distancing is nothing new. It started for humans way back at the Garden of Eden. The separation was not uh, going to be forever. God promised in Genesis 3.15 that one day someone special will come and breach the gap. When Eve gave birth to her firstborn, she thought, he was the promised one, therefore named him Cain. In Hebrew it means, I have gotten a man, the Lord. Unfortunately, he became the first murderer, a taker of life instead of a giver of life. That promise was not to be fulfilled for not a thousands of years. We recently studied the book of Daniel in our Sabbath school quarterly, it gave us a panoramic view of how the promise came to be fulfilled 
right on time according to God's plans. He showed us how he, would, he could see into the future and how he was going to execute the plan of redemption for mankind. But that's the big stuff. That's the big picture like Daniel and Revelation. It is about the vindication of God's handling of the great controversy virus called sin. The incarnation of the Son of God was the vaccine we needed. It was critical to the breaching of the gap between man and his holy God. But I want us to look at how Jesus came to show us what to do when it comes to handling isolation, lockdown, and social distancing. Let us look at a few stories on how Jesus dealt with those social distancing of his time. I want us to turn to Matthew chapter 9 and start from verse 18. Matthew chapter 9, verse 18. It's the story about the uh, invalid woman. It reads, I'll be reading from the King James Version. While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. And Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And behold, a woman, which was dis deceased with an issue of blood twelve years, came behind him and touched at the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned him um, about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort, thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. And when Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the minstrels and the people making a noise. That's the shorter version that's of the story found in Matthew. There are other versions as well you'll find in Mark and the Gospel of Luke as well. Twelve long years is a long time. She sought help from the doctors to no avail. Given the time she was living, there was no Medicare, let alone a safety net, such as a dis uh, disability pension from Centrelink. She had to spend all her living, according to Luke. In Mark, it was all she had. There is a possibility that this, that she was living in the streets after all her money was gone. The doctors were quite happy to take her money even though they couldn't fix her illness. As a matter of fact, her condition became worse. Who knows whether any of the medication they prescribed to her caused her to deteriorate. And also, back in her day, there was social distancing rules. And it's found in Leviticus 15, verse 25. I'll be reading from King James again. And if a woman have an issue of her blood many days out of time of her separation, or if it run beyond the time of her separation, all the days of the issue of her uncleanness shall be as the days of her separation, and she shall be unclean. Maybe she was dying to go to church but the dress code was too much for her. Maybe she couldn't afford a dress, let alone a tie and a suit after spending all her money on the doctors. Or she was required to behave a certain way, say the proper things, before she was allowed to join the circle of the saints. I know this doesn't apply to Bodhisattva Church, but um, these have been barriers I have seen churches put up that have turned people off from going to church. Do you think they are wise rules for evangelism? But she heard about Jesus, the name of, of the miracle healer that has healed some of her friends in the streets. 
She was determined to be close to him. If only I could touch his garment, she says to herself. That's all I want from this man. Surrounded by busy bodies, fans of Jesus who wanted selfies with him so they could, they could um, post on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook to show off the hanging out with Jesus. They, in fact, were preventing Jesus from helping those who needed him the most. They were in the way and blocking his, this lady from getting to him. Do you feel that church life is like that sometimes? Just when you need Christ the most, people, things, or circumstances get in the way? I can imagine that that's how that lady felt. I remember one time I was a bit overweight. I couldn't fit into my church clothes. And so I stopped going to church because I couldn't wear what people prescribed as church clothes. It wasn't until I was able to afford a new wardrobe that I was able to attend church again. We should stop judging people by what they wear because they do not, you do not know their struggle. She persevered and managed to touch his garment. Now, from a casual reading of the story, it was just a touch and Jesus felt it. And that was that. However, we need to read all three Gospels to get the complete picture. We need to dig a little deeper as to how the woman touched Jesus and why this his disciples thought he lost his marbles when he asked who touched him. If you read the uh, version by Mark and as well as Luke, it says that um, all she wanted was touch his garment. But there's a final detail that's found in the book of Matthew. And I'll try and do this illustration. If someone is standing up and bends over to touch his or her toes, you would draw attention to yourself and people will look, oh, what is he doing down there? What is he touching? Or what is he picking or she picking up off the ground? But Matthew has a, the, the minor, one word. All it takes is one word. It says in Matthew Chapter 9, verse 20. He touched the hem, or she touched the hem of his garment. Now, ladies who do a bit of sewing, or men, where is the hem of your clothing found? Is it the sleeve or the collar of your shirt? Obviously, the hem is at where your feet are. Therefore, she must have been on her. Uh, on the ground, probably crippled from all the medications she's been taking, as you are aware of polio and uh, how that came about in the history. So she must have been propping herself, walking on, using her hands to move around. Therefore, when um, she made it through the crowd and just happens to reach out and touch the hem of Christ's garment, if you knocked on someone's house and uh, you expect an adult to open the door, you'd be looking at your eye level. But you'd be sometimes shocked that there's a child standing in front of you to open the door. That's probably why the disciples missed uh, this lady and thought, oh, she's just someone off the streets. They dismissed her as maybe just another invalid woman on the streets. That's probably why they didn't notice her reaching out for the hem of his garment. Or maybe they did, but they tried to avoid her photobombing their teacup selfie angle. However, God stopped long enough to acknowledge her faith and perseverance, despite the social distancing and isolation for 12 long years. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good 
comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. Another story I'd like us to look at is also about another woman found in John chapter 4, verses 1 onwards. We will not read the whole story because it's a long one, but I'd like us to unpack a few of the texts and what's happening here. Jesus was on his way from Judea, and he was tired and weary, and he had to go through Samaria. Normally, Jews avoid going through Samaria. They would take the longer route just to avoid going through Samaria. But Jesus and his disciples went through Samaria. His disciples were not with him. It was just him by himself. And he came across the well, Jacob's well, where he met this woman who came in the middle of the afternoon to fill up her pot of water. And upon coming to the well, Jesus asked her for some water. And as you know, the, uh, the social issues that the Jews and the Samaritans had back in the day they were not to interact according to those from Judea. Only by necessity, but otherwise not even social kindness, not even offering a cup of water. They are not to interact with the Samaritans. So she must have seen him as a Jew and dismissed him straight away while trying to fill her pot of water. But him asking her was something that was unusual for her. She said this to, um, he said this to her. Then they say to the woman of Samaria, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest, drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. She was practicing her social distancing according to the social rules or requirements. They were not meant to speak to each other. And uh, every other part of the conversation she had with him, she tried to avoid his, um, his inquisitiveness about her. Jesus asked and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given the living water. And the woman saith to her, him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Again she was trying to avoid him. Changing subjects. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And she asked Jesus for this water. When the disciples came back and saw him with the woman, they were shocked. Again, they were practicing social distancing themselves. And it says here, verse 27, 4, John chapter 4, verse 27, And upon his, this came his disciples, and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or talkest thou with her? She dropped her water pot and went into the city telling them about this man she met, she believed was the Messiah, who told her about everything that um, she went through, her past, how she had only, she had five husbands and the man she's living with is not her husband. And as a result, people from the city started coming out to see Jesus, this man that she's talking about. It says in verse 39, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman. But after they heard Jesus speak, they said, And many more believed because of his own word. 
The interesting thing, though, was um, after he spoke with them, they begged him to uh, stay with them and spend time as they trying to unpack all these prophecies about this coming Messiah. He ended up staying there for two days, verse 40. And many of them believed. The interesting thing also as well was um, they never asked Jesus for a sign that he was the Son of God or a miracle. All they did was sat at his feet and listen, and they believed. Unlike the Pharisees who kept, and the, those in Judea who kept asking him for a sign that he was the Son of God. The differences between this woman, the first one was that she suffered isolation, not because of her fault, but because of an illness or a disease that happened upon her. And according to the rule, she was meant to stay away from church for 12 long years. The second woman was that she suffered isolation and social distancing because of her own past, of her own doing. She came to the well in the middle of the day to avoid other women in the community, the innuendos, the gossiping, and the stares. She came at the time of the day when there was no one there, and all by herself she could get the water and go back home. Fortunately, when she came, she found God sitting there, Jesus, speaking life into her. As much as she tried to resist his inquisitiveness, but she felt the words of life reaching into her soul. In the towards the end of the story, it says here, Then when Jesus has when he has come into Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went unto the feast. There's a quote here by the pen of inspiration found in the Gospel Workers reads, The worker in foreign fields will come in contact with all classes of people and all varieties of minds, and he will find that different methods of labor are required to meet the needs of the people. The methods and means by which we reach certain ends are not always the same. The missionary must use reason and judgment. Experience will indicate the wisest course to follow under existing circumstances. It is often the case that the customs and climate of a country make a condition of things that would not be tolerated in another country. In the Redemption sto Story, page 287-288, this is about Peter. And Cornelius. Peter spoke with Cornelius and those assembled in his house concerning the custom of the Jews, that it was considered unlawful for them to mingle socially with Gentiles, and involved ceremonial different dif, uh, involved ceremonial defilement. It was not prohibited by the law of God, but the tradition of men had made it a binding custom. As you're all well aware, the conference closed our churches for the last couple of weeks, maybe six weeks now. And one of the things I often heard from the literature evangelists was that um, their work will carry on until Jesus returns when every other ministry has stopped. Well, the coronavirus seemed to disprove that theory. I'm not having a dig at the LEs. I love the LEs, but I'm just making a point to prove my next one. That is, I went to church during lockdown. I enjoyed it so much that I went there twice a week. It's an offshoot of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. No, not the Reformers or some independent ministry. As a matter of fact, it is the most neglected offshoot of our church. Since we became inward focused and started women's ministry, men's ministry, singles ministry, etc., we've cast it aside as something for others to do. 
like the phrase, we pay, you pray. We're happy to toss money at it, but let it be someone else's problem. Even giving money to it as a church is on the decline. We've come up with excuses not to collect the offering for this offshoot of our church. This one happens to be called Adra Logan. Growing up in the church, it used to be the talkers within the local churches. The only Seventh-day Adventists there are the manager, Hank, training coordinator, Sam, and the chaplain, Pastor Andre. The other 99% are non-Adventist volunteers. Sam came to me at church one Sabbath and asked if I could help because their Monday driver pulled out. After my first Monday, I thought I should help out some more, so I... Um, so, more so I did Mondays as a favor for Sam and Tuesdays because of the people that volunteer there. As I got to know their names and their stories, I came to realize that they are just as precious to God as those whom I go to church with. They may not be comfortable in a church because of the social requirements that we put up as a church, like the dress code or the uh, Adventist lingo. You have to speak. But for them, Adra is their church, their family, where they have friends who do not judge them. I had a conversation with Sam and Hank the other day. We agreed that every church should be turned into an Adra center. It's a good excuse to remain open when there's another lockdown, even on Sabbath. The homeless and the needy don't take a day off just because we want to shut down for our own safety. Even in those moments of crisis, we as a church should step up to the plate and instead of hibernating for six or so weeks and doing ministry by remote control, I mean Zoom. No one is allowed in these meetings except for members with the password, right? So how are we going to fulfill the Great Commission by Zoom? What do you think, Odessit family? Jesus has shown us that we cannot do ministry in isolation or by social distancing. We have to get down where the people are. I'll leave you with this thought from the pen of inspiration. The followers of Christ are to separate from the world in principles and interests, but they do not isolate themselves from the world. The Savior mingled constantly with men, not to encourage them in anything that was not in accordance with God's will, but to uplift and ennoble. I sanctify myself, he declared, that they also might be sanctified. John 17, 19. So the Christian is to abide among men, that the savor of divine love may be a salt to preserve the world from corruption, counsels to parents, teachers, and students, page 323. And that, my friends and family at Odessa Church, is the word I would like to share with us this morning. We should be able to reach out to whomever, whenever, like these two women. One in isolation because of um, her condition, and what happened to her through no fault of his, her own. And the other in isolation because of her past and what she did. God showed us the way and how we should live in isolation and social distancing and the world we're living in today. Let us close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father. Thank you for the example that you showed us on how we should reach out to our fellow humans, those who are not in the faith with us, those who we do not um, run with in terms of circles of friends and influence. Ask, Father, for the courage that we may be able to share you with anyone that comes in contact with us and in need of you. May we be the example and the witness that you asked us to be in your great commission. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, uh
uh, goodbye to uh, my Bodesi family until we meet again. Thank you very much for the privilege of uh, inviting me to come and share God's word with you. Amen.